So we talked about research frontiers um, around groundwater recharge and flow um, and ways we could collect data, especially where in situ data were sparse or inaccessible. So um, this actually caused us a little bit of angst. Um, we talked about grace uh, you know, at the, at the large scale as a way of looking at water storage changes, but if there were multiple rivers sort of at a SWAT scale within that larger scale that we were looking at, that we might be able to use SWAT as a way to distribute that change as a way of downscaling grace. Um, Ed might have to help me here, but we were also talking about some non-event driven river discharge, um, using that as a way of estimating base flow from SWAT or ice set to potentially. Um, but then we sort of struggled with other options for um, systems where, especially where things were inaccessible. So we started to move into like vaguely accessible and then we just went like full accessible. But um, uh, we said if permission was available that we could use some drone based measurements potentially to look at things like temperature or uh, NDVI uh, to look at vegetation. And all, all we could get from this is maybe wetter areas. We weren't really sure that this was tied to groundwater recharge, but we were really just trying to find a thing. Um, if the system was actually accessible, we said there were maybe a couple of things that we could do. And I don't know if these are research frontiers because I think both of these things already exist, but um, you know, nuclear magnetic resonance is a way of imaging moisture content. So people have been using this for a long time. Um, more and more lately as that technology is, the signal to noise has gotten better and borehole instruments have changed a lot of uh, these measurements, but looking at changes in moisture content is a way of estimating um, recharge. And uh, if that site was also accessible, you could look at uh, changes in some sort of process, either precipitation or actually inducing tracers um, with some geophysical instruments like electrical resistivity came up um, over some smaller scales. And that is all we did. Um, we uh, kind of tried to wrap our heads, first of all, around around the scale of the problem, and we um, we uh, came to the conclusion that um, that the, it depends that the frontiers depend upon the size of the problem, and and so likely we would need multiple uh, technology advancements. Um, we talked about. Um, Kind of airborne as well as spaceborne, the airborne AEM, uh, the uh, geophysics um, uh, talk that we heard uh, that was very impressive. Um, the only downside of that is that it's not global, but it's doable if the political will is in you know a country if you wanted to to fly there. Uh, the good thing about it is it gets at the 3D and gets at subsurface property distributions. Um, we um, also talked about drones as well, large drones. We do a good job of measuring precipitation from space, uh, but we need to do a better job of um, runoff, temperature, and ET, and we thought that large drone-based measurements could potentially help us there. We also thought about the uh, GRACE mission, and um, you know the challenge, of course, the GRACE mission is great for closing the water balance, but the scale, uh, spatial scale is an issue. So we thought that you know if we had two pairs of grace mission, two grace missions, that would help us to knock down uh, the scale as well as the uncertainty. Um, uh, we uh, talked touched a little bit on GPS, which is something we hadn't talked too much today. Uh, it's a little bit tricky. It needs a ground-based receiver, uh, but it can measure surface water changes, and uh, so you can track the surface water with GPS and then track how that surface water interacts with the interfaces with the aquifer. Um, for some research that's out there, uh, far out there, we uh, talked about isotopes um, and any sort of water quality uh, remote sensing that's uh, on our wish list here. Uh, we talked about the benefit of INSAR for CalVal. And then in terms of a research frontier, um, we talked about the fact that all of these measurements are not measuring the same thing. So we don't have a good way of integrating measurements. It, could this be a framework, for example? Do we need that? Is there a new methodology, or we need a new methodology to combine its situ and, and remote sensing data together? We talked about machine learning and data analysis techniques as a key component to combining these measurements, although 
I think that there was some concern that machine learning can be a little bit tricky. Um, and uh, we also talked about the importance of technology that could kind of help to ensure that all people, that all citizens are, are participating in the problem. So we talked about um, combining geophysics methods and remote sensing for um, linking surface water and groundwater um, movements. Um, we talked about um, also combining hydrologic modeling with remote sensing. That has been, I mean, a lot of people are doing that already, but definitely downscaling. There are downscaling issues and uh, such as um, GRACE, um, using GRACE data to its advantage and uh, to bring it down to more useful resolutions. We talked about um, also combining climate projections for strategic planning for um, future recharge methods, how we can prepare for um, future um, management of um, groundwater recharge uh, where there might be uh, changes in precipitation and other variables. Uh, one important thing that we discussed was um, there's a lot of new advances in computational methods. Uh, it could be in, in geostatistics, it could be in craiging, AI, machine learning, that could these methods could be adapted in a smart way so that we, we can interpret or interpolate the existing data sets better. And not just for getting better results, but also for guiding where we can uh, where we should focus for getting in-situ in measurements for um, calibration, validation, and also just for getting new data sets, and uh, also for reducing uncertainties. I mean, reducing uncertainties with the use of these uh, new computational methods. Um, we also talked about, uh, just like the previous group, we talked about how we can engage city, uh, city, um engage citizen science, um, and also the availability of cheaper and newer sensors so that we can get um, uh, more and more in-situ measurements. I, I think i stop there. We, then we go to the next question. All right, uh, the question was about identifying when and where aquifers are being recharged in the source of water. Um, so uh, part of this was answered in question one, um, but we talked about some other possibilities uh, for looking at when and where aquifer was being recharged. Um, we have like a bunch of asterisks on this one, but like if your aquifer elas was elastic and you had injections, then maybe you could use INSAR um, to look at locations for recharge. Um, obviously the, the tried and true method for looking at groundwater recharge are, are boreholes, um, but that's pretty limited in terms of where you can do that, but the data are continuous in time. Uh, we talked about using sort of old school, um, you know, earth science inference when you look at a system and you look at its topography and its geology and maybe its vegetation, if the shallow, if the water table is shallow, um, you might be able to take a look at a system and figure out where groundwater should potentially be recharged. Um, Grace, obviously, at the large scale again. Um, in terms of sourcing the water, um, I, I don't think there's like a, a you know, a, a magic wand we can wave around and figure out the source of the water, but um, we could probably infer source of water depending on what the recharge data looked like. So does it look like precipitation or is this happening in a location where there's managed aquifer recharge, et cetera? Um, otherwise, if we really want to get at water source, we probably need isotopes or some sort of genetics of microbial communities in the water to parse that. Um, and the last thing we talked about in terms of when and where aquifers are being recharged is just the soft data or interviewing people in systems where um, data are sparse or um, otherwise there is an instrumentation. Um, we uh, talked about the importance of both um, in situ as well as model data. Um, in situ data are absolutely essential and models in many ways are key uh, to integrate, validate um, data, to put constraints on different components. Um, and 
recharge is very difficult to observe, and it's best estimated by, by models. Um, and I think there was a comment in the group that recharge is actually one of the most difficult things to measure in terms of groundwater. Uh, we talked about, um, about scale. We talked about the temporal scale that's needed. Uh, we need to have continuous monitoring, which of course comes from in situ measurements, continuous in time but discrete in space. Uh, it helps us, they help us to have the best chance of understanding seasonal changes in uh, recharge. Um, there is also, we talked about event based recharge and then using um, uh, paleo data to look at recharge in past climates to just get a better handle on, on recharge. Um, uh, talked about spatial scale. In situ data doesn't provide us with high spatial coverage. Um, it isn't spatially consistent. And uh, so the question came up, well, what spatial scale do we need to focus um, on to do monitoring? And, and we didn't have an answer for that. Um, we also talked about the importance of having good uh, precipitation and ET data, a better understanding of groundwater and surface water interactions, and the need for runoff data for the models. Um, we also um, kind of agreed on the um, need for both in situ data and models for um, these um, identifying recharge, but we kind of um, wrote down the specifics um, that included topography, um, geology, the layers, the land surface information, hydrology, and also near surface geophysics. Um, the, I th uh, we discussed that the human processes are very important, how the land cover has been changing, how the land use change can impact recharge, those information are needed as well. Uh, in terms of uh, identifying the sources of the water and the types of water, uh, isotope studies and biogeochemical markers, those could be useful. But we also had a uh, good discussion on the types of recharge and the scales of recharge. Um, do we mean um, just the inflow? Um, do we want to find out the net recharge? Or can we separate it out from the lateral flow that the basins are having, like the Bengal Basin that uh, Holly presented this morning? There's a lot of lateral flow in those uh, regions. How do we really um, separate that out from the recharge that is happening? And also the scales of this recharge, depending on, on the basin or the type of um, climate or uh, land surface that we are talking about. Um, and in combination with the surface water flow of that um, basin. Uh, the third question was about NGA resources that could help make meaningful progress in terms of our understanding of recharge. Um, we actually weren't entirely sure. We didn't have the benefit of Tony being in the room um, to, to know exactly what those resources were, so we ended up asking some questions. So one of the things we asked about was whether NGA has access to satellites or geostationary information that the public doesn't. Um, we assumed that was probably the case. Um, if so, uh, it would be helpful you know, if some of those data were open to sharing. Like We could maybe even image where water is and then isn't from some high resolution images to get at recharge. Um, if those data aren't available, um, then maybe there was a way for NGA to think about deriving groundwater characteristics, have people that actually do that, and then share that with the public. Um, but that was about as far as we got with that because we weren't entirely sure what was out there. Yeah, we, we actually had the same question about, um, I think it's the last bullet, we need to know what kinds of resources might be available. Um, but we talked about, um, you know, the uh, possibly supercomputers and cloud computing resources that universities and other research organizations could access and, and utilize. Um, we talked about um, opportunities for partnership or funding to work together toward a common goal. Um, for example, the eight countries share groundwater data. Can we expand that, that uh, list? Um, we asked if, if it would be possible for NGA to be a steward to get international partnerships to, uh, to do the work um, and uh, help to pay the science community to conduct the research. 
Uh, we talked about uh, utilizing NURI grants. And um, what we oh, lastly, we talked about um, techniques for uh, soil complexity or, or uh, tech to simplify soil complexity as a uh, may be something that the NGA could help with. That was it. Um, we actually had the NGA guy in our group, so we did not have the, those <laughs> questions. So uh, we came up with these three uh, kind of um, ideas that uh, we want to focus on data fusion from multiple types of uh, sensors and also multiple types of data um, to come up with uh, better measurements of recharge. Uh, definitely, there should be a research focus on transboundary aquifers which um, is definitely um, a key knowledge gap in, um, out there in terms of managing groundwater. And that applies to both water-rich systems as well as fossil groundwater systems. Um, and um, looking at also how the surface water and groundwater is interacting in um, these water-rich systems, that is also a key, I think um, there's, um, there is a lot to learn in um, in that um, that uh, area. I think that's that's where we start. Yeah. Um, we this fourth question was basically the same as the fourth question on the last. Um, breakout group, which was examples of successful collaboration. So we actually felt like we more or less covered that on the last go rounds. So we didn't have a lot of creative new input. There's a couple things up there, um, but other than that, I'm, I'm going to punt on that question. We, we did as well. So if you have the examples, sorry. <clears throat> Instead of looking at uh, just the successful examples, we all actually wanted to look at the four transboundary aquifer treaties that are known to be out there, and we want to see what works and what doesn't work in those treaties, and we thought that would be uh, informative for us. We also want to look at interstate um, um, compacts of water sharing and usage in the US, and I thought maybe in India uh, we could look at, because India has a lot of interstate water issues as well. And also, um, Mike, uh, I don't think he's here. Mike talked about uh, the upper San Pedro basin in Arizona. There's a lot of um, groundwater movement between Mexico and the US where we could learn from that basin as well. So we wanted, it's not really successful examples, but we thought these are the areas we could focus on to learn more about um, collaboration opportunities and research on research.